All right. So for the midterm tomorrow, uh, just to remind you, check the Moodle announcement. It's going to be in the Lasam building 1006. And make sure you show up only for your register section. Okay, in the morning, 10 a.m. or 11.30. Make sure you show up in the right section. Okay. Now, I would like to go over just two slides very quickly. So when you were studying for this uh, lecture for generics, you see that there were basically two concluding diagrams to show you the difference between generics versus inheritance. I just want to show you, uh, just explain that to you very quickly. Okay. Basically, you can see that this particular example over here, what we have is you have two dimensions. One dimension is vertical over here, and the other dimension is horizontal over here. Okay. Let's talk about the vertical. Vertical is something that you're very familiar with back in even 2030. Vertical means the higher you are, that means the more abstract you are. For example, if you talk about a set, uh, for example, just uh, let's say talk about mathematics. Set is the most general collection you can have without any ordering. And if you want to have a little bit more specialized version of the set, you can introduce order, in which case you have a list of books. And then the next more specialized version will be not only that it's going to be a sequential list, and it's going to be a linked list. So the, the lower you are in the hierarchy, the more specialized you are. So that's exactly how we deal with inheritance. Every time if you want to introduce a subclass, that's because you want to add more features or to specialize uh, certain features to redefine. Okay? So the vertical line there tells you if you go from set into list and then into linked list, just more and more specialized version for the subclasses. Okay? That's about the first dimension. And horizontal dimension over there talks nothing about being more specialized or being more abstract. That one basically is about this. Remember the first time we talk about generics in this class, we talk about you can either have a stack of integer, you can have a stack of string, or you can have a stack of accounts. So it doesn't really matter what the types of the elements you store in the collection. The way you store and retrieve in a stack is simply following the FIVO principle, right? The first in, uh, la sorry, LIVO, last in, first out principle. But what's really stored inside a type is can be parameterized. So that's why the functionality will just be the same. It's just about different types of element you can store. So that's why it's a horizontal direction over here. Okay, just make sure you understand this. So now, so how can you apply this to your design? I would say in general, let's talk about generic parameters. Every time if you're trying to define a class for a collection, it's going to support some storage and retrieval of elements, in which case you should really try to make your class generic. So that means you can actually be very flexible about what kind of elements you can store in your collection. And then when you talk about vertical direction over here, it's mainly about being more specific or being more abstract. Let's say, should you have a student class? And, but you may have a specialized version for the student class, which can be either resident students or non-resident students, right? It's different that, uh, it's there are orthogonal issues you have to think about for your design. Okay, any question about this? Okay, inheritance versus type generics. If no questions, uh, I think the next slide is just another example over here. Just another one, the same idea, okay? Vertical versus horizontal. Is that okay? Good, okay, let's talk about something new. Okay, so now I would like to start with, not state design pattern, something called uniform access principle. Okay? It's quite an easy idea to principle to talk about. I'll just use one example to show you, and then again to emphasize that this principle is not just for iPhone. You can also support it for any other language, for example, Java. So I'll show you both iPhone and Java, and then summarize by telling you how you can make a decision, how to apply this principle over here. Overall, the idea really is, whenever you want to support a feature or method uh, for your classes, okay, for your design, so there are two ways you can consider. Should I implement this particular feature by using computation? Or should I implement this feature using storage? Storage versus computation, basically. That's the overall picture. And we just see one example to see the uh, difference. Okay? However, verse, uh, storage versus computation is only the concern for you as a supplier. As far as the client is concerned, they don't care. All they want to make sure is the way they get access to your API is remain is remaining as stable as possible. So if you change from storage to computation or vice versa, the client shouldn't care, okay? 
That's why it's called uniform access principle. It's from the client's point of view. Okay? Let's see one example together. Okay, uniform access principle over here. Let's say we talk about two-dimensional points. Okay? So there are two ways you can implement a two-dimensional point system. Okay? Let me just show you on the iPad. Okay? Let's go over the two possible ways, and then we'll go directly to the code in uh, both iPhone and Java, and then we'll summarize the principle. Okay, over here, so the uniform access principle example we're going to do is about how you can implement a two-dimensional point. Okay, so there are actually two systems you can adopt. One is called the Cartesian system. I think this is the system you're most familiar with, which means if I want to identify a particular point uh, on the plane, I simply store the x and y value, and that's it. That's easy. There's another system which you may not know so well. It's called the polar system. And the polar system works basically uh, in a different way. So now if I want to identify this particular point, right, let's say from the client's point of view, of course they want to know what's the x coordinates and what's the y coordinates. But the way we retrieve the x and y is a little bit different. In the Cartesian system, you can think about we simply store the values for x and y. It's like a storage. Just store that. But now, in the case of the polar system, what we store is something different. What we store instead is to see this particular point, what's the distance between this point and the origin? And that's the distance r. And then we also store the dist uh, from this line, from the point to the origin, there's an angle over here, we call it phi. We store these two things, okay? You guys should know very well how to calculate the x and y coordinate uh, accordingly, right? Okay. For example, you know that if I want to know, given that this distance r and this angle is phi, right? That means this distance over here is going to be r times cosine, right? Hopefully, I don't have to, you to explain that. And also, the height over here should be r times sine phi. Okay. What does that mean? That means if the clients actually want to get access to this particular points, it would it would involve certain computation. More precisely, for you as a supplier. If the client says, I want to get the x value, you should do some corresponding computation, which is r times cosine phi. Agree? And similarly, if the client wants to get access to the y, instead of returning just a storage value, you have to somehow find out the storage values for r and phi and do the computation, which would be r times sine phi. So now this highlights the difference between the two systems. From the client's point of view, they want to identify a point on a two-dimensional plane. But for you as a supplier, depending on what the secret is, remember we talked about information hiding. Information hiding simply means any design decision that's subject to constant change must be hidden from the clients. And this is kind of the design secret you want to hide. Because whether you adopt the uh, implemented point using Polar or Cartesian, it's not a concern for the clients. They don't need to know. All you gotta make sure is the way you support the access to these two are uniform. Okay? Any questions so far? Are we okay? Okay, and we're gonna see some code in both iPhone and Java. Okay. All right, let's go to the uh, code. Okay, that's exactly what I said. You can uh, just uh, go ahead and have a look. So now, so now the uh, from the client's point of view, they simply want to say, given the objects of type points, they want to call p dot x versus p dot y. But what the underlying system is, either Cartesian or Polar, is not their concern. For you as a supplier, you can decide uh, uh, by your own reasoning. Okay, now let's have a look at the code all together. Okay, so let's say we have a class called points over here, and then we have uh, two constructors over here. We got make Cartesian, make Polar. Let's say that's how we choose to. Uh, so depending on which constructor the client call, you're going to uh, initialize the attributes uh, accordingly, differently. Right? And then we also got x and y over here, x and y, and real. Right? So now one thing to note, from the client's point of view, they are simply just going to call the x and y. But how you actually support the values for x and y, it can be up to your decision. It can be either by supporting x and y being attributes or by supporting x and y being queries, computation. Okay, let's see. 
uh, how the two versions might work. Okay. Okay. What I would do is I will show you. So either storage or computation, either way. Let's talk about version number one. Okay. What about I show you version number one, version two, uh, all together to save time. Okay. So now we got two versions over there. The blue one over there is the Cartesian. And the green one over there is the polar. Okay, let's have a quick look. Before we look at anything else, I want you to look at from the client's point of view, how does the interface look like to us as a client? The interface for both versions looks like this. First of all, we have X and Y in version number one. We also have X and Y. Oh, that should be Y, not X. Okay, X and Y is a typo. Okay, for version one, we got X and Y. For version two, we also have X and Y. Okay. So from the client's point of view, they can get access to both X and Y. Interesting. All right. Okay. No. Uh, okay, so now let's talk about version number one. For version number one, we're simply going to support the constructor over here called make cartition over here, right? So that means the client is simply going to pass the new x value and the new y value, and then we assign them accordingly. Right? That's a very easy first version. Okay? Now, what about the second version? The second version there, we actually got attributes r and p. Of course, it, over here, you may also decide to actually say this should be exported to none if you want to, but it's not really uh, required. Okay? You want to say r and p are simply going to hide them. So that means as far as the clients are concerned, they can only see X and Y being public. X and Y being public. So, okay, that's up to you. And then for this second version over here, we also got another constructor over here to be implemented called make polar. Okay? For make polar here, again, we now we are passing different values for the clients, simply the new R and new phi, right? The angles. And then assign them accordingly. And now what's really different now is if you look at the uh, implementation for x and y in the second version. You can see over here, even though the signature is really the same, just x of type real, y of type real, and here also x of type real, y of type real. But in the first version, both are attributes. Okay? But in the second version, they are queries. You're more like a feature, right? Just like a methods, like a accessor in your Java term. And then we're simply going to say whatever r value is times cosine phi. Okay, whatever the feature it is corresponding to your iPhone implementation. And also R times sine phi. Okay. Can you kind of see the difference between the two implementations here? Okay. So for supplier, you can easily switch between the two. If you switch from one to the other, the clients should not be affected because from the interface point of view, it's simply just X and Y that's being supported. For version number one, X and Y are being supported as attributes, like a storage. For version number two, X and Y are being supported by as a queries computation. Okay. Any questions? Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. After this, what I will do is I will go on to how do we test it? So over here, even though I already mentioned about the clients, but again, we are looking at the code for the supplier. Let's now really see what the clients should really uh, use the points. Okay. So now let's see. We try to test the points. Okay. So from the client's point of view, uh, let's see. This is the, the example I would like to set up. Okay. Just a little bit math over here. Okay. It's not really complicated. Basically, what I'm trying to do over here is, would you agree if I have a right angle triangle over here, I can simply say the three sides can simply be 2a, a, and also a times square root of three. You agree with that, right? Okay, let's, let's just say we agree on this. And then what I will do is I will try to use this particular triangle over here to set up the test so that from the client's point of view, they can get access to the polar system or get access to the Cartesian system. But the x and y value they will get back will just be the same. Okay, that's kind of the, this, the test I would like to show you. Okay, so now you can see that those, so the point we are talking about is over here. The x will just be a times square root of 3. And the y value will just be a. Okay, so these are the two values we're talking about. Okay, let's try. 
Okay, over here we simply have a test. Uh, the normal test is not a violation test, just a normal test, Boolean test. So we have the uh, uh, the different a, x, and y, and then we have two points over here, p1 and p2. Okay, and now we simply set it up. We say the a over here. So a here correspond to the a over here, which can be any value. For now, I simply say it's five. You can set it up to be 10, 20, doesn't matter. So the triangle will just be scaled up accordingly. Okay, and now let's have a look at these two lines. So we have this line here and this line here, the two lines, okay? You can see that these two lines are basically calling two different constructors over here, right? The first one is calling make Cartesian, and the second one is calling make polar. That means when we create P1 as a client, we're saying that try to initialize everything internally using the uh, Cartesian system, okay? And then when we are trying to do the second one, we're saying that trying to initialize everything using the polar system, right? Either way, okay? So now if you have a look at uh, P1 and P2, okay? Now here is my question for you. If you look at this line over here, I'm gonna do some test. I'm basically saying that even though P1 and P2, they are of different objects, creating using, one is using Cartesian, the other one is using Polar. But I'm comparing their values over here. Okay, now, I want you to be very precise to me. Let's say P1 the X, the blue, and also P2 the X, the orange. Which one is using storage. When I say p1.x and also p2.x, there, uh, there are two basically feature call over here. But now, what's really involved in p1.x in order to evaluate? It's more like storage, right? Because remember p1.x, basically, remember p1.x, p1 was created using Cartesian, right? That's basically the version one that we talk about. If you go back there, so that means we're simply just going to return x being an attributes. X was simply just initialized by whatever value it was uh, passed when the object was constructed, right? That's p1.x. But what about p2.x over here? p2.x, this line here. Is this, is this still storage or is it a different way of accessing that? It's a computation, right? You can, if you think about it, P2 is of type, uh, also points, but the way we created P2 was, we say make polar, right? That means when we say P2 to the X, it is going to call this version of the X over here. Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong one. It's calling this one over here, which is going to say whatever R it is, which was passed over here. This is the R, right? This is the phi, the angle, right? And then we're gonna do this computation all together in order to get an X value. Okay. Now, similarly, also for over here, if you look at the uh, second, uh, second part of the conjunction, uh, let me be consistent with the color. So for the second part of the conjunction over there, what we have is P1.Y over here is also the uh, Cartesian system, just the storage. And also we have over here, that's the P2.Y, right? That's using the polar, the computation. Uh, any question about this? So the uniform access principle is quite an easy one. Don't over, overthink it. Basically, what, from the client's point of view, you simply just call p.x, p.y. But from the supplier's secrets, they can easily change from one design decision to another. In this case, just from polar to Cartesian or vice versa. Right? Of course, the, the design decision should be hidden from the clients. It's pretty much like the, the shop and cart example we talk about in the iterator pattern, right? You shouldn't expose the uh, array detail to the clients, so they don't depend on that, okay? Okay, if you have no question, so what I would do is ask you the following question. How would you do this in Java? Any idea? Well, actually, the way I show you just one way to do it in iPhone. What about just go back to your job, uh, wearing your your Java hat. How would you, what's the best way to do this? How about just a, a reasonable way? Uh -huh. 
you can definitely use attribute. Yeah, actually, you know what? In some way, I tell you what, the only difference, let me remind you one thing about the syntax, okay? Just about syntax very quickly. In Java, uh, let, let me mention over here, just syntax-wise. I'm not sure if you already picked it up. Hopefully, you did. If you talk about IFO versus Java, let me talk about Java first. Uh, when we talk about get access to attributes, you know what? Let me just move this a little bit over here. Oops. Okay, like here. Let's say IFO versus Java. And then attribute versus query. So when I say query, I mean accessor in Java, right? So now, let's say in Java. How do we tell an attribute versus a query? Parenthesis, good. So if I say some objects dot A, I know A must be an attribute, right? But now for query, it's actually object dot, for example, some accessor method with parenthesis. Okay? That's good. In IFO, again, it's their design decision. If the accessor takes no parameter, then you will just say O dot feature. Okay? Versus O dot attribute, also F. So the same. You don't need parenthesis. That's only a syntactic difference. It's not really going to affect the way you apply the uniform access principle. But now there's one thing you gotta be careful. Because in Java, you don't want the clients to really get bothered by either calling this without the parenthesis or calling this with the parenthesis. That should be somehow hidden from them. Okay? But how do we do that? How do you have a uniform interface for clients in Java? I actually already mentioned a solution. Uh, yes, but what kind of mechanism do you need in Java? How do you have a uniform interface for the clients? What's kind of the construct you need? Uh, actually, you need interface. Right? There's an interface in Java, right? That's why I said I already mentioned the term. Anyway, let's have a look. Good. Let's have a look. One solution, which is reasonable. Let's have a look very quickly. So now the idea is completely the same. I just want to show you very quickly how the same design principle can be satisfied by just another language very quickly. Let's say for, uh, so this I already covered, just in iPhone. What I want to show you is the Java, Java end. Let's use interface, okay? Then what we'll do is we define some interface over here called points, get x, get y, okay? So now you can see that, so where, how is the uniform access, princ access principle uh, being satisfied over here? That means any clients, if they want to create an instance of the points, can they use point directly as a dynamic type? In Java, you cannot, right? Remember, let's say point is an interface type. So that means in Java, can you say point P1 is assigned to new point? Can you do that? No, you cannot because point is an interface, so you cannot do it. Okay? Just don't forget. Okay? So that means if the user, the client wants to use the point, they have to choose a proper class that implements this interface, right? However, if any class that implements the interface over here, they must follow the consistent method headers or signature over here. Okay? That means the uniform access is, is, is as follows. The, uh, the client will simply say get x or get y, right? With a parenthesis. Okay? So now, I'll show you very quickly how you can do it. The same idea. Okay, you can definitely have a look uh, and try it out for both uh, languages. So now we can have one implementing class called Cartesian Points, okay? uh, which is not interface, not abstract. So we can say implements the points, and then over here we simply make a height, x and y being attributes. And then over here, the way to perform, uh, provide uniform access is by uh, implementing get x and get y. Right? And then here we simply say return x and return y. So now let, let's imagine this. Apparently, I'm going to have another class which represents the other strategy, which would be polar uh, system. So let's say if I have a public class, polar points implements the points. How, what would be the difference there? What kind of attributes do I need to store over there? Should it be still x and y? It's going to be the distance over there and the phi, right? It's going to be different. Okay, that's difference number one. And what about to support the two excessive methods there, get x and get y. Add more methods 
Somehow you need some computation there, right? You just cannot return x and return y. It's simply not there, right? Good. Okay, that's kind of the idea. But from the client's point of view, they just cannot tell. Okay. Good. So let me just go there. If you see that over there, you can see the way we initialize the polar point, like a make polar, right? Make polar point. And then okay, x will simply uh, you can use the cosine from math uh, library and then times r. And similarly for the get x, uh, sorry, get y, you see uh, use sine, and for get get y, you use uh, sine over here. Okay, that's the difference from the supplier side. But what about the clients? Let's have some tester very quickly to test this to make sure that there's really some uniform access. What I can do is I will do. I will simply have a unit test for you, okay? So the values I'm setting up over here is exactly the same as before using this triangle over here, okay? The same setup, okay? But let's focus on some other issue. If I say line number six, I say points. Remember the principle we talk about, program with the interface rather than to the implementation. So now you can see that what's the static type for P1? It's points. That means the dynamic type, as we learn, can be any of its descendant classes that is not abstract. In this case, it can be either Cartesian points or polar points. Okay, that's the nice thing about polymorphism that we learn. Okay, so now we say Cartesian points over here, and then for next one, I say P2, which is dynamic type is polar points. Okay, you can see the values we pass also different. One is x and y, and the other one is the r, the distance, and also the uh, the angle. Okay. And one more thing, line number eight, line number i, line number nine. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at line number eight. I say p one dot get x should be equal to p two dot get x. Okay. So now because of dynamic binding, how is p one dot get x and p one dot get y going to be different? Sorry, let me say it again. I keep saying the wrong thing. Let me be precise here. At line number eight, we got p one dot get x and also p two dot get x. They seem to be calling the same method, but are they really calling the same method? Not really, right? Basically, they they're using the same interface, which is uh, satisfying the uniform access principle. But the dynamic ties for p one and p two are actually represent two different implementations, right? So now p one dot get x would it be storage or computation? Storage, right? Because P1 dynamic type is simply from line number six is Cartesian points. So it's gonna be storage. Whereas P2 dot x will be computation. Because from line number seven, uh, dynamic type for P2 is polar points. Right? It's going to do the uh, corresponding uh, cosine uh, computation. Okay? And similarly for line number nine. Guys, any question about this? Are we okay? I'm moving a little bit fast over here without uh, going too much detail because it's very easy principle to follow. The rest will just be following this particular example in both uh, languages. Yes. So for professor, so even though like, you know, you're implementing the interface, yeah. it's the same intuition apply? The same apply, yes. Even though it's not inherently. You can think about in interface is just like a, uh, it's more like a superclass which cannot be the dynamic type at the runtime. The reason that it cannot be a dynamic type is there's certain methods or feature that are not imp implemented. Yeah. So if you actually Okay, let's uh, mention that very quickly. The question is, okay, I can tell you that remember we talk about defer class in IFA, right? You can think about defer class is a little bit like an abstract class in, in Java. An interface is more like extreme case for abstract class where every method is abstract, right? Okay, similar principle. Let's say, for example, let me just talk about idea over here. If I have either an interface or a deferred class over here, I'll say C1, okay? Where I simply, let's say this is deferred, okay? C1. And then I got method one over here. And then, this is how you draw it. Let's say I got two implementing classes. I got C2 and C3. How do I express the idea that C2 and C3, they have implemented every feature? I put a plus, right? That means they are effective, okay? So now, let's say, like what you said, for C2, I got M2, a new method. I also got C3, I got M3, okay? So these are the new feature or methods I have. So now, a question for you. 
Let's say I do the following. Okay. If I have C1 over here, and then I have object is new, and then I have C2. Like that, right? You can see for O over here, static type is C1. Dynamic type is C2. That is okay, because C2 is a, is a descending class of C1. Okay? So now, can I say O dot M1? Apparently I can, because uh, M1 is a method that's defined in the static type, which is C1. Can I say O dot M2? Are you sure? Okay, so O dot M2 though. Yeah, because static, remember we are talking about compilation rule. And I said again, uh, compilation rule is just the same for iPhone and, and Java for all the OOP. So that's why I'm just doing that quickly in Java. So now O dot M2 would not be uh, compilable simply because the M2 over here is only exists in the descending class of the static type. So that means it cannot be used. Okay, the same rule apply for what we have learned. Okay, any other questions about this? Yes. Can this, interesting, can this uniform access principle be, be satisfied by overloading? So first of all, what's overloading? Good, okay, overloading which exists in Java, which means you have the same method name, but somehow you have different uh, parameter types, right? Uniform access principle has the following intuitive sense. I would say no, because for the following reason. Okay, so now I'll give you one example. Okay, let's say if you say overloading. You know, I should say yes and no. Okay, yes and no. There, there are some yes cases, there are also some no cases, okay? So let me, let me give you one example. If I have a, uh, by the way, in iPhone, there's no overloading, okay? So that means you cannot have the same feature name appearing twice, even though you have different parameter types, okay? It's only uh, a, uh, supported by the C family language, like uh, Java or C Sharp, okay? But let's talk about it very quickly, since you talk about uniform access principle. Let's say in Java. Let's say I have uh, the following method. If I have N1, overload, uh, can overloading support uniform access? Okay, so my answer is yes and no. Okay, yes and no, over here. What's the yes case? Let's say in my class over here, I have M1. Let's just talk about mutator method, okay? If I have void and M1, it simply takes an integer argument, integer i, and then I do something over here, okay? And then I have just m1 again. But now rather than taking an integer, I can take maybe a string, okay? In this case, I have uh, s. In this case, it's more like you have a uniform access because the way you call the method will be calling the same name but pass only one single argument, right? So now, I can simply say objects, let's say of the same uh, corresponding static type, I can say the m1, and then I can call 2, versus o the m1, in this case I can pass maybe some value, maybe uh, uh, Allen, for example. That's more like a uniform access, you're just calling the same method, right? And just pass different argument type, and the compiler is going to decide which version is going to be called. For this one over here, it's going to call this version, and vice versa. What about a no case? Well, no, not really same type. Well, if you, well, by the way, if you try to say void m1, and then you pass integer i, right? And then, of course, you do something here, and you say another one, void m2, integer j. Would it even compile, though, in Java? Would it even compile? By the way, this is not allowed in iPhone, because you cannot have, uh, sorry, m1 and m1. Sorry about that. That's what I meant to write. Oh, that's too big, sorry. M1 and M1, okay? This is not even allowed in iPhone because in iPhone you cannot have two feature names 
they are the same. Okay? What about if in Java would it be allowed though? The fact that I have different formal parameter uh, names, i and j, don't really help for the compiler. Why? From the client's point of view, if a client simply call o.m1 23, how do I know which version they are calling? There's no way to know, right? Okay, okay. So signature is really important. So this does, does not even compile. Okay. So now, what about the no case over here? Let's back uh, go get back on track. The no case would be, what about I have void over here? Let's say m2. I got integer i, just integer i, just like that. And then I have another one which would be void. Also M2. Uh, let's say I have string S N integer I. In that case, I simply got different numbers of parameters. And that means you cannot just use it in the same way, just by passing one single argument, right? So now the way we use it would be O.M2 for the first one I can give value two. And for the second one I can say O.M2. And then I can give a string a, and then some value too. So that they are not exactly uniform access. That's why I said yes and no. Oh, uh, yeah, you can say that. But I would say it's better to satisfy the uniform access principle in Java to by defining interfaces. That's the best, because all the method that's actually in, uh, defined the interface must be supported in the subclasses, right? Yeah. Okay. So the, the lesson is you should really try to apply this principle here in any of the languages you're trying to program, not just in Eiffel or Java, any language you have to use. OK, one more thing I want to mention before I conclude about this principle here, and then we'll do some design pattern. Okay. OK, this is what I want to summarize for you. It's debatable. OK, I just want to give you some idea. So now the idea about the uniform access principle is we want to give the supplier some freedom about secretly change the design decision from one to another, like from Cartesian into Polar. Okay? But now you also have to say for you as a supplier, should you choose more towards storage or should you choose more towards computation? What's your, in your intuition? I agree it depends. But what would you say under what circumstances should I choose storage? Expensive what? Okay, yeah, yeah. Anybody want to help? If the feature is accessed very frequently, well, you know, when you say a feature is uh, accessed very frequently, that's true. But if the computation's running time is very low, it's very cheap, let's say it's a constant operation, what we learned in 2011, right? It's a big O for that particular feature, even though it's uh, accessed so frequently, but it's still very cheap, right? So I would say there, there are different criteria you got to think about. I'll give you some idea. There are at least two criteria you can think about. Let's say we got two dimensions over here. Dimension number one, either frequent access or infrequent access, okay, about how frequently you access the feature. And number two is how expensive in terms of runtime it is to execute a feature if you want to compute it. So one is about time efficiency, and second one is about uh, frequency of accessing the feature. Okay, let's have some idea over here. So I do have a table here. So I would say, for example, let's say so you got uh, I got two dimensions over here. Either it is efficient to calculate or inefficient to calculate, versus whether it's frequently accessed by the clients or it's not frequent to be accessed by the clients. How do you think about the first row? The first row might be a little bit easier for you to decide. What about, okay, let's do cell by cell, okay? What about the first cell over here? If I have to access this feature so frequently, and however, it's just efficient. Storage? I'll, I'll tell you what the problem for storage is. Let's say, let's say this. Uh, let's think about the bank class, okay? Let's say in the bank class, uh, let me just make it a little bit more visual to you so it's easier for you to follow, okay? And let me, let me tell you what a drawback is 
for storage. Let's say I have a class called bank. Let's say somehow we decide to implement a balance using an attributes. Okay? So we simply say balance, and then we have, let's say, integer. Let's say we already got our deposit, we have our withdrawal feature, which each one of them is going to update this balance over here, right, somehow. Let's say we also got many, many other features which might affect the value for the balance. So what does that mean? That means the maintenance of this attribute's value would be inconvenience. That means, you ha let's say, somehow, if we want to change the, every time if you talk about fe uh, want to implement a feature, you have to worry about how to change the value for these attributes, if applicable. That's a maintenance problem, okay? So I would say, if it is not expensive for you to calculate for this particular feature over here using computation, you should just do it. Because it can save you quite a bit of maintenance job for this particular attributes, okay? Okay, I'll just write it here. Uh, need to main, need to maintain this attribute value in all features that modify its value. Okay, that's one thing to to note when you want to make a decision. Okay. If you really decide to make it an attribute, that's kind of the price you have to pay. That means every command you're trying to define in your class, you have to think about, do I have to modify these particular attributes? Rather than having a single place to implement that particular feature as a query using computation. Okay? So that's the kind of design decision. Okay, so I will just go back here for the slides over here. So now I would say computation. Okay? Efficient and frequent if that's efficient. If it is inefficient, then you just gotta do uh, storage, right? Okay, the first row is easy. So now in the second row, it's a little bit uh, kind of uh, uh, relaxing for us to concern, which would be infre infrequent, which means the client actually don't use this feature that often anyway. So I would say now you should really consider for you as a supplier, which, one is, uh, which way is easier for you to implement your code, okay, since we talk about design. So I would say if the client actually doesn't really uh, access this feature so frequently, in which case I would say storage if it's convenient for you to maintain, which means there are not so many features that have to update this value, okay? Otherwise, you'll go for computation, okay? Any question about this? I would say this slide is actually more important than the iPhone Java code itself. I'm just trying to show you what, how you can make a design decision, okay? Go for either storage or computation. And how do you judge about efficiency? Apply what you learned from 3101 and 2011, right? That's kind of beyond the scope of this uh, course. But we assume you know that. Okay, good. Yes, question. You, uh, can you state your question again? You mean what's the uh, space complexity or time complexity? Space complexity. Computation. What's the space complexity for computation? Well, you, well, actually, it depends, right? Depends on how you actually do the computation. If the computation involves creating like a two-dimensional matrix, then the space complexity can also be huge. But in our discussion here, we're simply assuming that time complexity is really important, more important than space, right? Scalability. For scalability, yeah, maybe. All right. Okay, guys, any question about uniform access principle? Okay, good. And what's the best way for you to learn about one principle? Apply that, okay, to maybe your lab three or projects. Okay, so now I would delay the discussion for voice safety a little bit later. What I would like to go is, I would like to go to directly to another design pattern. It's gonna be a new one. And this one is gonna be very interesting. My plan for today, I will give you the, what the problem is and see how general the problem is that we want to solve. And then I will give you two possible solutions, which are bad. And we're gonna criticize on them. We learn about what's really bad design, and then on Thursday, we're going to learn about what's the good design, which is the state design pattern. 
And the good, uh, the state design pattern will rely on your knowledge about polymorphism and dynamic binding. Okay, that's why we talk about those issues beforehand. Okay, let's see what the problem is for the state design pattern. Okay. Let's say we have a reservation panel of an online booking system. Uh, you can definitely click on the link. Let me see if, you, if the link still works. Let's see. Okay, something like this. Okay, let's say if you want to book some flights, okay, it's a real website. Basically, they will take whatever information you enter, let's say you choose Toronto to Vancouver, for example, and then choose the dates, and then once you click on different options there, and then uh, they will simply allow you to go to the next page, right? And then once you go to the next page, they, will, they may ask you about, do you have any dietary requirement for your itinerary? And then they will ask you for a credit card number or your membership uh, number, right, whatever, okay? So there are many, many different paths you might go through when you are trying to make through uh, the reservation process, okay? That's just one example. So that's the problem we are trying to solve over here. And for the purpose of, of our discussion in the class, I'll simply show you a simple interface like this, okay? Let's say over here, let's say initially we got Toronto to Zurich and then departure dates uh, between June 23rd and, uh, uh, yeah, after June 23rd and on over before 24th, and then we got uh, different available flights as an output panel, and then we got different action, which means from this particular page, we can we got different options there. We can either choose zero to exit, sorry, we can either go for zero to exit, one to help, and two for further inquiry, or three to reserve a seat. Right, just different actions we can perform. So now. Abstractly speaking, what kind of uh, design model you can create for this kind of system? Basically, what we have is you're in a certain page, and that page offers, offers you a range of different options. Depending on which option you choose, you can do, go to another different page, have a way to navigate between the system, right? So what you have uh, there's something that you have learned so far in the CS curriculum that will solve exactly this problem abstractly. Can you think about anything? Should I give you hints? 2001. Do you know what DFA is? No? DFA? Uh, what does, what does DFA stand for? Uh, deterministic finite automata, right? Okay, or finite state machine. Okay, e either way. Okay? So finite state machine is a very generic formal model for this kind of problem. Basically, you got a state transition graph, which I'll show you just in the next slide. You s the way for you to design for this uh, for solution for this kind of problem is, you gotta think about what states you have, and how to navigate between the states, and then think about what the corresponding options uh, actions are, and then implement them, okay? Let's just go very slowly. I will show you, first of all, abstractly speaking, what kind of abstract statement, uh, what kind of finite state machine we're gonna have, and then we'll see two possible design to that, okay? So what I will go is, I will show you over here, so state transition diagram, okay, or finite state machine for any interactive system. So you can say, in general, this kind of system we are dealing with is an interactive system, which means the user will simply interact with your system, and your system has some predefined behavior corresponding to the user. Whatever the request the user make to say, I want to go for action number five, now I should bring them to another state of the system. Okay. So now let's see this. Uh, I do have uh, a set of states. Uh, also, for each state, the list of applicable transitions. Okay, finite state machine. And this is the finite state machine we're gonna consider for this particular lecture on the design pattern. It's complicated enough. Of course, for any realistic system, you can have way more states and way more transitions. I have a little test for you. Okay. Um, if you have a large number of states, as n states, what's the worst case for the number of transitions you might have, based on what you learned from 2011? You got a prerequisite check. Yes, go ahead. n square, right? Which means every state can just go to every other state, right? It's uh, n square. Okay. So that means real, uh, in reality, in the worst case, you might end up. Let's say you got a, uh, let's say you got 1,000 states. 
you may have a one million transitions. Hopefully not. I'm just saying in the worst case. So that's kind of the problem we want to solve. You want to have a, a very elegant solution which can solve the questions in an elegant way. But the first two design I'm going to present to you, they are not good. Okay. Okay. That's. Uh, let me just uh, go to the diagram over there. I do want to show you just a few more, a uh, few details very quickly. For example, let's have a look at over here. Okay. So this is the finite state machine you just see on the slides. Finite state machine. Okay. So we got different states. Uh, we got exact uh, in total five, uh, six states. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. For example. Let's say for this particular state over here to say we are now in the state number three called sit inquiry. In this state, we have how many options do we have to go out? Two, right? One way is to go this way here, or you can go this way here. Either action number two or action number three. If we should we choose uh, action number two, we will go to another state called flight inquiry. If we choose uh, action number three, we we'll go to reservation. Okay, etc. Of course, if you want, so this graph over here is not so directly implementable. One way to implement that is by using something called a transition table, which you also learned from uh, 2011 or 2001. And now, how do you implement a transition table? What's the most obvious uh, implementation strategy you have in your mind? Graphs are uh, true, but graphs is not yet. It's only a data structure. But what's the more concrete data structure? Why well, should be graph? I was apparently it's graph because there's a cycle there, right? How would you implement a graph in this case? I'm not sure. Uh, in year 2011, how many strategies did they talk about for implementing a graph? Which two? I, I don't know. That's why I'm asking. If you remember, uh, for example, a JSNC uh, a JSNC uh, list. And also, adjacency map, and also adjacency matrix, right? Something like that. Okay. So adjacency matrix could be a nice candidate over here, just using a two-dimensional array. Okay. Anyway. So now, let's have a quick look. I want to show this is still just a transition table over here. We're talking about. Let's see the correspondence very quickly. Okay. And then we are set for the first design. So now over here in the uh, finite state machine, which part? of the transition table should I look at in order to find out all the defined outgoing transitions for state number three? Which row should I go into? Row number three here, right? Okay. So that means row number three would be basically saying that from state number three, which is over here, I can either go out to using uh, action number two, and in which case it will bring me to state number two. Over here, right? Everybody okay with reading the uh, transition table? Okay, I want to make sure. Yeah. And etc. There's a two-dimensional array would be a very suitable implementation for this. Okay. Okay. So now let's now have a look at our design challenges. Exactly what I said before. We see the first design. If you got n states, of course you get you might get uh, up to n square transitions. That's the challenge. Okay. So you don't want to hard code the diagram directly into your uh, code, in your design, which we'll see. And then, so now I have a question for you. Let's say I have, well, every time you want to think about if your design is good or bad, you want to think about extension or modification to your existing design. That's a very important criteria. Let's just think about this. I will, I will switch back to the diagram in just a moment. How do I merge two states together? Let's say I got state number two and state number three. Let's think about it, just abstractly. Let's say I got these two states over here, state number two and state number three. Let's say the customer's requirements change so that we want to merge these two states into a single one. What would be the kind of steps you have to take care of? Yeah, true. You gotta somehow merge the transitions, right? And also you gotta delete certain transitions as well, right? So now you can think about, let's say, if I decide to maybe I can simply delete this state over here, and then somehow I need to maybe merge this transition over here and this transition over here into one single one, right? Because that's kind of state is deleted. And also this transition over here 
and this transition over here should be merged into a single one as well. Okay, you get an idea. Okay, I'm sure my point is, abstractly speaking, it's kind of easy to see, but depending on how you set up the design, such extension may not be trivial or maybe very expensive or very ugly for you to perform. Okay, if it's very ugly or inefficient for you to perform, that's an indication of poor design. Okay, good. Let's go back to the slides, and then we'll. Okay, you can see that. So now for general solution, yeah, so you can see uh, different uh, application over here, eBay, Amazon, and Taobao, right? Different uh, sites. So this is a very uh, useful design pattern to, uh, to learn. Are we ready for the first design? Okay, let's see the first design. Okay, we've got two to look at today. Let's see the first one over here, first attempt. Let me present to you exactly how it looks like, line by line. And then I'll switch to iPad and I'll hear your criticism. How about that? Okay. Before we move on to the second one, which we'll just makes some gradual improvements. Let's say the first one, it's a little bit like the style for your 2021 assembly code. Design number one is kind of intuitive in the following sense. We simply declare label for each state. Let's say the label for state number one, let's say one initial panel. You can see one initial, right? initial panel over here. And then we also got two flight inquiry panel, and three, and four, and five, and six. So because we got six states, so we got six labels. Below each label, I'm also put in common, simply means you got certain actions over there, which means for each particular state, what well, you have to perform. I'm just omitting the details over here, okay? But we got six labels over here. And how do you get to a particular label according to what you learned from 2021? There's a key word for that, right? Go to, right? Okay, just make sure you know that. So now let's see how we can do it. I'll give you one, one particular example. Let's say for uh, state number three, okay? Let's see the detail for number three, okay? Basically, well, that's, I'm just enlarging that, you know, to show you the complete details for that. Let's say this is label for number three. What we have is, uh, we have a loop over there. We say we're going to, first of all, di display the inquiry panel. For example, you can see in the very beginning of the slides, uh, let me just show you very quickly. When I say display, that means this is the kind of panel we display, right? Display some panel to the screen for the user. And then, what about a second step? And then we just do a loop. Okay, let me just show you once more. Okay, display the panel for this particular state. And then, so when do we terminate for this particular state? Basically, we want to say, we want to make sure we terminate this loop only if the user gives us some valid inputs. Basically, we, this is it's an interactive system. We let the user tell us what they want to do if they want to enter their credit card number, or they simply want to exit. So whatever input they give to us, we have to validate the inputs. So we only terminate this particular loop if all the inputs are valid, which means we go to the next step for the, for the states. Okay, if you see the logic over here, until it is not the case, either the, wrong, the answer is wrong or the choice is wrong. Okay, and then we go to, so what do we do? We simply say we read the answer from the user, okay, whatever information they have to provide, and then we had to read their choice. Remember for state number three, what choice can a user have, valid choices? It can be either choice two, or it can be choice three, by right? either one, okay? And then, and then we'll say, if they give either wrong answer or wrong choice, we can give them an output message to say error. If you're currently working on the ETF projects, this is similar to the command classes, right? You don't really crash the input, uh, crash the program if the user gives you wrong inputs. You simply give them a warning message, okay? Anyway, so now, as soon as we exit from the loop, you can see that, so this process uses answers outside the loop. That means it's guaranteed. The uh, exit condition is actually not the case. That means we got valid input, uh, valid answer, and val also valid choice, okay? Process uses answer, and also now we can check to see what kind of a choice they give, okay? And now we say that if the choice happens to be two, okay? In this case, according to the diagram, 
if the, from state number three, if the choice is simply two, that means we should go, we should transit to state number two. Otherwise, if the choice is three, that means we should make a transition to state number four, right? That's exactly what's said over there. Okay, two or three. And that's it. And this is the detail for uh, the label three seat inquiry panel. You can imagine that others will be defined maybe in a similar way. Okay, now let, that's about the first attempt. Okay, basically got six labels. Depending on how many how many states you have, you have that many labels. Okay, what I would do is I'll switch to this first attempt. Okay, do you have any criticism about this this, this design, or well, you think that's good? You're you're saying that uh, you reuse, well, you don't really reuse. You don't really reuse. For, uh, for example, be more specific. True. Basically, you can see that, for example, let's say this. Let's say over here we say read the user's choice C for the next step over here, right? So now, let's say if the user gives a wrong choice, we can say in, you're giving the wrong choice. But sometimes you're repeating this code here, right? That's true. Any other things? That's kind of minor thing, I would say. Okay. Anyone else? Question for you. If I have, can you imagine how we're going to write the code for state number two? Is it going to be very similar to label number three? Lots of, Lots of uh, duplicates over there, right? Because you can think about if we, we try to program for number two over here, basically you can still display something there with a minor difference, and then but the loop structure will just be the same. And then the way you read the uh, user's input will be the same, and then it's only about this part here that may be a little bit different, right? Because now in state number two, the applicable actions might be different, but you will see lots of duplicates over there, okay? So that's definitely one thing that's really bad. There's another thing that's really bad. That's a little bit more abstract. So now here we talk about an online system for air flights. Let's say I want to develop a new system. And the new system is going to be about reserving concert tickets, let's say, rather than air tickets. Can I simply reuse the code, though? You, somehow you should really write it from scratch, right? Because the error messages will be different. Whatever you display initially will be different. And also, over here, Whatever cases you're checking over here is also different. So there's very few stuff you can really reuse. Okay? So that so there are two things. One is about code duplicates between labels. Okay, lots of code duplicates. And one thing is solution is not reusable. for another problem, or for just for another interactive system. So these are the main drawbacks, okay? And now I want you to have a look at maybe it's, uh, drawback number two a little bit more carefully. When I say the solution is not reusable for another interactive system, the very nature of this uh, first design principle, uh, this, this uh, sorry, the very nature about this first attempt of the design really is you're trying to hard code this diagram over here as the entirely your, your implementation over here. There's no separation of concern. Okay? We'll try to see, we'll see a little bit more clearly what I really mean. There's no separation of concern when we get to the second design. The problem really is you hard coded this diagram over here entirely just as the go to and also label structure over here. That means any time, if you want to modify just a tiny bits over here, there might be multiple places you have to fix in the design, okay? Okay, that's about the first one. Hopefully this is not something you will end up with as a first attempt, but I just want to show you anyway, okay? 
Uh, any question about the first design? Okay. Okay. Good. So now let's go back to the slides and over here. By the way, uh, you should really avoid using things like this. What's called about uh, it's called spaghetti code. I'm not sure if you've heard about this expression before. It simply means if you if you think about how this can be kind of spaghetti code. At a runtime, you can think about like this. At a runtime, let's say I'm using the pink arrow to refer to runtime execution. I start with state number one, and somehow I go to uh, uh, abstractly speaking, I go to state number four, and then I go to state number two, and then I go to state number five, and then I go back to state number two, and go to state number six, and etc. If you look at a runtime trace of your system execution, how does it look like? It's more like a spaghetti. That's why people call it spaghetti design, okay? Which is really bad, okay? That's why, just as a side note, uh, I'm not sure if you uh, you learned about this uh, back in your Java introductory course. You should really have a single return statements for your uh, accessor method, rather than having so many returns, uh, either return from the loop or return from the if statements. That can also make your code like spaghetti code at the runtime. Anyway, just something related. Okay, so now let's go to very quickly go over. Uh, you can just go over these uh, drawbacks for what we just talked about. Okay, so these are exactly what we said about the criticism about duplicates of the code between labels, and also you simply the it's too application specific. And as the last point, you cannot reuse this just for another system. Okay, you can read it through. Okay, we already talked about. Let's now have a second solution. The second solution, I believe, would, would be much closer to what, what you, you might uh, attempt at first. Let's have a look, the second one. The second one there is somehow organized. It's called a top-down hierarchical solution. Okay? I'll give you some idea, and then I will show you some code fragment to explain. Okay? And the second solution there, let's just introduce something that will improve the first design already. The problem, again, about the first design is your, uh, your code, your system, is entirely depending upon the control structure for the state transition diagram. Whatever you see over here is hard-coded entirely in your code over here. So I said there's no separation of concern. So now, how can we introduce a separation of concern? Well, we're going to basically try to put everything about the state transition diagram into a single feature in your system, just a single feature, which means only that feature is going to be responsible for how, how you move around the states. And other feature might be responsible for other things. Okay, let's have a look. If you look at the slides, what we're gonna have is we have a new feature called transition. Okay, and the transition is just going to implement a transition table that we had uh, that we look at. Okay. And the transition is very easy. We got source and we got choice. And then whatever return value is, is the uh, target state. Let, and also you got the uh, uh, precondition, postcondition. What's the precondition over here? Well, precondition is simply saying that uh, the source state is going to be one between one and six, right? Either, one, e either of the uh, six states. And also the choice can either be action one, action two, action three. It's a very obvious precondition. And you want to make sure the valid target state is also somewhere between one and six. Okay, so now let's have some, uh, have a look at some example. Okay, let's have a look at it. look at this. Uh, this is the feature I just showed to you over here. So that's a transition feature over here. Okay, so now how do we implement this? One way to implement this is we simply use a two-dimensional array like here, right? Either at the runtime. Uh, let's say we start with indices one. Okay, let's just see one example. So now, if the client is trying to call the feature as following way, if they say they call transition, which is over here, and they pass the source and the choice, and apparently you can see the source state uh, over here satisfy the precondition is between one and six, and also the action over here is all the valid ac action between one and three. So now, what should be the return value over here? Can you see? What's the return value for this particular transition? According to, uh, you can see that on the left-hand side, I show you the abstract transition table. 
And on the right hand side, I show the implementation, but both are consistent. Would it be? It should return an integer value, right? What should be the value in this case? Well, the choice is two, isn't it? Six? Are you sure? Don't guess. Wow. Guys, uh, are you sure? It's really easy to look up, right? So three here is the source states, three. And two is the choice over here. <laughs> uh, isn't that two? Wow. Uh, wow. Good. It's two, right? Uh, should we do one more? Okay, I'm, I'm worried. I'm really worried. Now, what about this? Transition, okay. Three, three. What, what would that be? Please, don't make me worried. Four? Yay. Three and three. Four, right? That's how you look it up. Good. Okay. Yeah, and then hopefully you can see the direct correspondence between the table on the left hand side and the two dimensional array on the right hand side, right? Okay. That's why I said a two dimensional array could be a very intuitive or suitable implementation for that. Okay, good. So this is the only new feature we have. And this feature is completely responsible for moving from one state to another. So we don't have that go-to statements anymore. Okay, we don't. So now, let me present to you the high-level design for this second one. Okay, the the reason that we say it's top-down and also hierarchical is as follows. This is from uh, let's say for the from the supplier's point of view, this is how we implement the uh, system. At the top level, there's only one single feature, which I'll show you in just uh, a moment in detail. It's simply called execute session. Execute session simply is we're going to indefinitely interact with the user until they are done with this particular reservation. Okay? And then the execute session there, which we call level three, just the first level, can be divided into uh, four different stages. The first stage, we're gonna initialize, and then we make some transition. And once we make the transition, we're gonna execute the particular state we are at, and also, we want to check to see if the state we are reaching is a final state. If we are reaching the final state, which means, uh, which means the user either cancel or they have already paid, so we can uh, let them log out, right? And also, we got another level over here. For executing the states, it's a little bit like if I'm at states, uh, let me give you one example. If I am at state number five, right? That means I, get, I got different options to be offered. I can either go for uh, action number three, or I can have that action number four. Depends, right? So each state, depending on where I am, I can have different options there. Okay? So now that's actually what this is about. Okay? So execute states can also be divided into, first of all, I display the panel for this particular states, current states. And then I can read the input from the user. I will validate whether the input from the user is correct or not. I will put, print some message if necessary, and then process and go to the next states, basically. So again, uh, what's really the top-down approach over here? Let's summarize very quickly. At the top level, we are trying to interact with the user, which can be divided into one, two, three, and four, four stages. Specifically, if we want to execute to do something about the current states, depending on what the current state is, we're gonna display, read, correct, message, and process accordingly, depending on what the current state is, okay? Let's see the details for each level quickly, okay? So now, for execute session there, it's a top level. Let's see very quickly how we do it. So what you can expect to see for execute session, when I show you the code, is going to have one, two, three, and four, four different stages. Let's have, let's have a quick look, okay? So now we talk about uh, execute session. Okay. Okay. So now over here, execute session there. So we have something like we have current states, which is going to be recording where we are in the diagram in the system, right? And then we simply say in the right uh, upon in the, uh, launching the application for the reservation system, we're going to assign the current state to be the initial states. And then we say that we only try to exit if the current state is the final state. That means we're done. Okay, so far so good. And then when we are not in the final state just yet, this is what we're gonna do. Two things. First of all, 
we'll try to see, we'll try to execute the state. Remember, execute the state is over here, the next level, which we'll see in just a moment. We'll try to execute the state based on what the value for the current state is. Because it is so important to know what the current state is, so we can execute the state accordingly. That's why you see that we are basically passing the state information from level three to level two. So this is the states that we are passing from one level to another. Can you see that? Okay. So what I want to draw your attention to is basically over here, the current states. That means we're passing the state information around from level to level. Next line over here, once we are done with getting the choice from the user, what we do is we try to make a transition for the states, in which case we simply call the transition feature that we defined in the previous uh, page over here, right? The transition. We simply call the transition over there and with the current states and what's the choice, right? Like that. And then make a transition. Okay, can you just stay with that for another 10 seconds to see if you got any questions before I move on? I would say design choice, num uh, design number two is not too bad, but we can we deserve a better solution. I would say number two is not too bad. Okay. It's straightforward, intuitive. Any questions about this top level before I go on to the next level? Okay. If you have doubts about how the execute state is going to be defined, we'll see that right in the next page. Okay. Okay, let's see the next one okay, quickly. Let's have a look at, once we pass, uh, let me see, uh, let's see exactly how this line over here is going to be executed. Okay, we pass the uh, state information to the execute states. Let's see. So now for the execute states, basically, let me remind you something about the, in the previous slide. For the execute states, we're going to have display, read, correct, message, and process, right? Got different stages for that. Let's have a quick look. So now for the execute states, so we have over here, uh, let me use a highlight. Uh, we have the current state as one of the uh, parameters, the only parameter. And then we're going to return some integer. We'll see what an integer is in just a moment. And then we're going to get the answer from the user, whether that's a valid answer or not, and then whatever the choice user gives to us. Okay? Again, it's a loop up to here. And then we only exit from the loop if the answer the user has given to us is valid. For example, if only if they have entered some valid credit card number, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't let them through. And then you can see that if it's a valid answer for the user, then we'll simply go ahead and process, exit from the loop. What if it's not a valid answer yet? What we will do is we'll display the current state information over here, and then we'll try to get another answer from the user, so read the answer. And then we also need to see what the current state is, depending on what the prompt message is. And also, we can also get a choice for the user to see what's the next action you want to do. You want to go to action number two or action number three. And also, we can also valid, validate their answer, which will be another uh, feature to write. And also, we need to pass the current state information as well. And then we want to say if it is not the uh, valid answer, then we'll try to give them some message, error message. And the error message is going to be different depending on what the current state is. Okay? Can you already see any problem over here, just from this fragment of code? And of course, if we exit from the loop, that means everything the user gives to us is valid. That means we try to process the answer. And then we we'll simply say what the current state is, and then process accordingly. Can you see any problem over here by what we have seen in this execute state feature? Is there anything that looks like a duplicate? It seems like we are passing around the current states for every feature, right? That seems to be the case. I can tell you that if you have to pass around something so often, there's also indication of poor design. Because you could have made that particular current state as a current object. And let me just give you some insight over here. Let me tell you what. Display over here, let me compare that with you, for you. When you say display, 
current states. That means you're passing this value around. If I can somehow make the current states as an object, current states and then dot display, that would be much better. Because now, depending on what the dynamic type is for current states, I can, due to dynamic binding, call the corresponding version for display.